who's just one thing I'd like to ask you. It's your, about your nickname. Where did the nickname come from? What was the inspiration behind Funkmaster? Uh, just from my wrestling stuff back in uh, college, in high school. Right, okay. It just comes from a non-traditional style of competing. It just uh, wasn't very good at the, uh, what do you call it, the basic fundamental stuff. Right, okay. You have your upcoming fight this weekend against Augusto Mendez at UFC Fight Night Kansas City. How are you feeling ahead of the bout? I feel really good. I feel really good about this one. I think uh, I think I'm going to finish him in the first round. How has camp gone to plan? Sorry. Has camp gone to plan? Yeah, I mean it was a short notice fight. I asked for um, some short notice fights. I told him, I told uh, the matchmaker I'm. I'm training almost every single day, at least once a day, so I'll be in good enough shape. I want to stay active. And uh, good thing he actually came through, man, and so was, this is uh, this is good for me. Uh, you train at Cerro Longo Fight Team. Uh, a fellow former Cerro Longo athlete, Matt Serra, has often revealed that one of the best things in preparation for fights is a beetroot juice in your diet for endurance. Is this something that has been keen to push to you guys at Cerro Longo? Beetroot juice? <laughs> That's correct. Beetroot juice. No, he's actually never. He's actually never even. I've never even heard that he takes that. No. I know it's good to give you a good natural pump. Uh, right. Was in nitric oxide. It opens up the uh, blood vessels and all that good stuff. <laughs> Instead of taking all that uh, pre-workout stuff, but um, I guess that's the natural way to do it. But yeah. No, I've never yeah. actually heard him talk about that. I know he normally takes his uh, five-hour energy shot. Right. Okay. <laughs> Uh, about your upcoming bout, after uh, two sort of controversial losses now, both of you have split decision, how important do you feel it is to get back to winning ways? Uh, it's very important, man. You always, every every fight is your most important fight, and uh, especially if you're you're chasing UFC gold or if you're chasing gold in any organization. I think a win here, especially a finish, I think it's going to let everybody know that I, I am still the real deal. And um, I'm not to be overlooked, man. I think I, I think I had two great performances. Uh, this, well, it's not even – I can't really say great. I say the Caraway fight, the first round, I think I had a, a, a superb first round. And then I faded. Um, and that was my own undoing, doing three workouts a day before the fight. You know, I had – I had uh, Man, that sh every time I think about it, it just annoys me. Yeah, I just did something I've never done before, working out so much on the day of a fight, and I was just so shot after that first round. And I think that first round has showed that I, you know, I can, I'm a man on fire, and I can beat anybody when I'm on. Yeah. And I, I think the Sun Tzu fight, I just, I respected him a little bit too much, even though I thought I was winning the first, the first, I thought I won the first round, I thought the second round was close, and I definitely thought I, I took the sec, the third. I think the third round it took me. I realized after the second round that he had nothing for me, and it was just a little bit too late, I guess, for the judges. But in my eyes, I thought I was winning the entire time. But I don't know. I thought I, I thought I had a two to one, and it just came up short, you know. That fight could have gone either way. Guys from his camp were saying that I won. They thought I won. They thought they weren't sure that he was going to get the nod, and they thought I, I edged it out. But it is what it is, and that's what happens when you leave it to the judges. You just never know what what they. With their scoring, you just don't even know what the hell they're looking at. Yeah. You, you did seem very upset after that Aslan Cow fight. By the sounds of it, it, it is something you're looking to do to take the take the fight out of the judges' hands this time? Yeah, man. I, I'm a finisher. That's what I do. I The Caraway fight, I almost hit, killed the guy with a freaking full nose. I almost ripped his head off and detached his arms. But the guy the guy was like Gumby. Any, any other normal man with muscles in their bones and their body would have... Uh, they would have t they would have tapped, you know. I yeah. can't get my arms like that. If someone would have put me in like a, a full Nelson like that and just shook me around a little bit, I'm tapping instantly because it's just way too painful. My arms would probably pop out the socket. Um, the Sunset fight, so I you know I didn't really go for the finish. I think uh, I I started opening up in the third round, but it was just a little too late. So yeah, man, most of my fights I I, I finish fights, man. I I frustrate guys. I take them down to where I want. I drown them, and then I eventually they they. They, they just want to tap. They just want to get out of there. Regarding sort of the split decisions and the judges, controversy with officials has been quite a topic at the moment. The latest being the Masasi-Weidman match. Did you catch that by any chance? 
Definitely caught that fight. I almost beat somebody up at the bar for talking shit about well, my what, teammate. What were your opinions on the decision to stop the fight? I thought it was a good call at first, and then it's like the best way to explain it to people, it's an unintentional foul. And people want to say it was legal afterwards, but then when you go frame by frame, now people are starting to change the tune and say, well, yeah, I think it was still illegal. Even though the rules are still written funny when they said the palms have to be down. So there's a whole bunch of different things that, that, that come into play. But at, at, in any competition, the judge is the sole supervisor. So whatever call he makes is the final call. So for you to go in there and say, oh, I thought that was a legal knee, or I thought that was a legal low blow, kick to the nuts. And then you tell the, the, you tell the, the fighter, you have up to five minutes to recover. Take your time. Then you go look at a replay, and you have an aside official jump in, a side judge, not even judge, a side referee jump in and say, hey, that shot wasn't illegal. And then he goes back in there and says, hey, that shot wasn't illegal. Uh, your five minutes is up. Um, you know what? We're going to bring the doctors in, and this fight's, a no, this fight's a DQ. Not a DQ. This fight's a loss for you. But that doesn't make any sense because you would have kept fighting had you told them you have to keep fighting. Yeah. So, that's, it's, just, it's simple. I don't know why people are making this a lot more difficult than it needs to be. It's, I think it's pretty black and white. Um, whether or not the knee was illegal, that's another story. But the rules of how the things, how things are supposed to be handled, I think Dan Mergliata did a terrible job of, of uh, handling that situation. Because at the end of the day, he had the final say. And he can say the, the doctors came in. Chris said he was fine. I saw Chris. Everyone heard Chris through the TV saying he's fine and he can still compete. So at the end of the day, it's on him. You can't go in there and say it's illegal, look at the TV and say, oh, you know what, that 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 low blow, that kick to the nuts wasn't really that low. So I'm sorry, man, you got to fight right now or this, you know what, we're going to have a doctor look at you and now this fight's off. It just, it just doesn't make any sense. It's kind of ass backwards. As you say there, people are still unsure whether it was legal or illegal. Uh, but one thing, do you think New York have to revise some of the rules in plays, such as the non-existence of replays? I didn't even know you could watch replays for, for fouls. If that was the case, when a sun child kicked me in the, the nuts the second time and punted me, and you can hear the cup and the ref doesn't see it, where, where's the replay on that? And that's not in New York, that's in Colorado. So I don't know. I, I never even knew there were use of replay. I thought it was the referee's sole discretion of yeah. what he sees and deems fit to call in the middle of any specific MMA bout. And that's the way I think just about every single fighter notes it. Man, when it comes to commission, not to bash New York, New York is very new and they seem to be yeah, having a tough time getting getting everything together with um, with all the other commissions. But I think no commission wants to take part in any final say or or judging or ruling of any type of incident in an MMA bout. When you see all these these illegal things happening, people getting choked unconscious like that one fight, the girl got choked unconscious and she got saved by the bell. The ref had to wake her up at the end of the fight, but yet she won the fight. That How does that even make sense? <laughs> if you are unconscious to answer the bell, you lose the fight. Yeah. I, just don't, I just don't understand how confu- – how do you need somebody to, to, to rule on that? And the lady tried to appeal the fight, and I felt bad for the lady. She couldn't they, – they just threw it out. So it's like, man, the commission doesn't want to get involved in anything. They don't want to do the right thing. None of these commissions want to do the right thing. And it is, it's kind of unfortunate for the fighters, and we're the ones that get scapegoated because it's our records, and we have controversial decisions or rulings that end up staying with us for the rest of our lives. And ultimately that – that affects our career, that affects our trajectory, and yeah. it affects money when you're trying to get sponsorships and endorsements and things like that outside of the fight world. You know, that that one loss or that one win it makes a world of a difference to other people, man. To us, we understand what's going on, but to other people outside who aren't a part of the culture, it makes a world of a difference. And I think the commission needs to do more of a, a better job of being responsible and being held accountable for the actions that take place in their sanctioned bouts. Yeah. Uh, it's just kind of sad, man. They kind of just leave us out there to dry. And they say, oh, you could just go through the appeal process. But, yeah, we're not giving – we don't give a shit anyway. So we're just going to throw this out. 
And that's kind of how it comes off. It's a slap in the face. It's a slap in the face for us putting in all this hard work and for them to just sit there on their asses, not really doing shit because they ain't training. No. So we're doing all the hard work. They're sitting there watching us at their, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pleasure and entertainment at, for, for, for their leisure and they're getting paid off the backs of us. And then when we have a complaint, they're supposed to actually do their job, do their job. They just shut us out. And that's, that's kind of messed up. It's really effed up. It wasn't the only problem with the New York. There was a lot in the uh, build-up at the weigh-ins. We had the Pearl Gonzalez saga. And then uh, a controversy that I know you're certainly aware of is the uh, Daniel Cormier weigh-in. Uh, Jones, oh, is, Jones, is, <laughs> Jones has described it as one of the dirtiest things he has seen in sport. Now, many have seen a video you posted mimicking that incident. Were you disappointed with Cormier's actions, or was it simply just a joke? It was simply a joke. I thought it was hysterical that he got away with it. I mean, did he get away with it, or you know, or was it a blind eye being turned? I don't, I don't know. I just hope if I have a tough time making weight, I can uh, just tug on that towel just a little bit. <laughs> As UFC 210 passes, all eyes are on Kansas now, and of course you're about with Augusto Mendes. It seems to me that no matter the outcome of the fights, you're not one to shy away from a challenge. Are you simply insistent on fighting the best? Yeah, man, 100%. I, I told, you know, it's funny, I texted Sean Shelby... Um, while I was on the plane, I said, hey, man, um, I don't know what's going to happen with this fight, but I'm letting you know now I want to fight in OKC. So I want to be on this gravy train of fighting every two months if I can. Um, yeah. I think that would be ideal. I mean, of course, I'm going to want to take a break at some point, but I'm not getting any younger, man. And I want to take advantage of my youth and I want to get more experience and I want to keep growing as a fighter, keep growing as a person and just uh, doing what I love to do. And, of course, getting paid for it is just a, a cherry on top. And, uh, yeah, man, I, I'll take any 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 challenge. The, you know, they're, they're born with two arms and they're born with two legs just like me. So it's just who comes up and who's more prepared on, on fight night. So I think that's what it's going to come down to this weekend. You spoke there about taking advantage of your age and fighting as often as possible. Since 2011, we haven't seen you fought more than twice in a calendar year. And whilst there has been numerous cancelled bouts, is it still something you're looking to be more active? Yeah, 100%. Like I said, I told Sean, I gave him a – even before this fight, after the, the fight with um, a Sun Sal, I gave him a list of, I think, six names. And I told him, hey, man, any one of these guys, I'm down to fight. And uh, it just so happens I got one of the one of the names that were on that list, and it was Augusto Mendez. I wanted yeah. to fight Yuri Alcantara, but it would have been in Rio or OKC, and I just really didn't want to wait that long. And I told him, if there's anything that comes up sooner, please keep me in mind. And he did. And here I am now. And I told him, if that uh, June card is still available, I'm definitely down to make the trip. So, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just having fun, man. I'm enjoying the ride, enjoying the journey. This thing's not going to last forever, you know. So why not get the most out of it while I can? Uh, some people might think it's silly to take a short nose fight. But what's the difference if you're, you're constantly training? What's it? What I need to constantly prepare and keep continually doing the same thing over and over and over for one opponent for eight to, to 12 weeks. I think that's kind of, kind of silly and it, it's really draining on the, on the brain, man. It's mentally and physically draining. With Mendes and yourself both being excellent on the ground, with most of you wins come by submission, is this a fight that you expect to go to the ground or have you got something else planned? Yeah, this fight's going to hit the ground a hundred percent. Um, I plan on putting him on his ass a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> Whether or not the fight stays there, that remains to be seen. It's, I'm just gonna play off of the energy he gives me, man. Whatever, whatever openings I see, if you know, if he starts reaching for a leg, I'm gonna freaking drop an elbow in his face. I'm gonna smash his forearms. Um, whatever, whatever he wants to do. If he wants to try to initiate a clinch, I got stuff from there. I got, I got a whole lot of tools in the arsenal, and it, it just comes down to me just firing on all, on all cylinders, and that's that's pretty much it. I just have to be on. You can do everything right outside of fight camp. If you're not ready for a fight night, that's where that's what the, the that's what it all comes down to. And then I I look back at the Caraway fight and that was a big learning lesson for me. I did everything I could possibly to prepare to prepare for that fight. I stepped on the scale 152 pounds a day of that fight. Huge, larger than charge. I, I do, it was the most lifting I ever did, the most hill runs I ever did. I felt in phenomenal shape. I was crushing. Crushing it through the, through circuits and crushing it through through sparring sessions and still feeling great and getting on the bag afterwards, and then uh, just the day of the fight, man. I you know I 
I respected him so much that I was trying to do extra work all fight week and extra work on the day of the fight and it ended up just backfiring. So now I just learned, man, you know, when, when the work is put in, the work is put in. And all you got to do is just get mentally prepared to go out there to do some damage and to, to deal with damage. And that's really what fighting is. How hard can you get hit and how much can you keep going? And I, I think I'm going to be able to outlast Augusto. And uh, hopefully I find one of those big shots early, man. I, mean, I plan on I plan on trying to take his head off with one of these kicks. It's uh, I'm excited, man. I'm excited to go. A win over someone of Mendez's caliber is only going to propel you towards the top five in the division again. At just 27 years of age, do you think it's a matter of when, not if, you get the title shot? Yeah, I think it's a matter of when. Um, and, you know, the, things can happen. You know, he could catch me with something, and, you know, that could be the end of my night. But I'm realistic, you know. I, I know I have way more tools to win. His best chance of winning, I would say, would be trying to make it an ugly fight. And I can fight ugly if he wants to fight ugly. If he wants to fight up close and tight and personal, we could do that and get in a phone booth, and I, I'll make it a gritty fight. I got elbows that will slash him from anywhere. So if he wants to take it there, we could take it there. Um, I think his best his best shot of winning is trying to catch lock up a submission or hopefully landing a, a Hail Mary home run punch. I just can't see anything else that he can possibly – do to end the fight if that makes any sense yes besides i don't know maybe he has cardio for days i haven't he didn't look like much of a cardio machine against frankie signs and frankie signs is one to push the pace and um even his other fights his fights haven't really gone that long so i think my experience versus his he hasn't really had as much as much cage time and i think that's going to be the difference and that's just being honest and and calling it how i see it on paper and from what i'm looking at based on our past performances and what i'm doing in the gym today with fighting in Kansas, uh, just how important is location for you for a fight? And would you like to fight in New York under the UFC promotion? And I would love to fight in New York. They got that July 22nd card coming up at the Nassau Coliseum. Uh, it's literally two, two and a half blocks away from where I grew up and where I lived for about almost 15 years of my life, um, where I went to high school, middle school. So to fight there where all my friends and family are right there in my hometown, it's in my hometown. It's in Uniondale. So for me to be able to fight there, I know I could bring out a, a huge crowd. And um, I just hope New York does the right thing and let, lets me fight. Uh, I, I don't know what that's all about. They let they let all these other people slide with all these all kinds of crazy shenanigans. I just don't understand how I get cleared by doctors, by multiple doctors in they, I don't know. It's it's a weird weird thing with New York. I can fight anywhere else except for New York. Um, so hopefully that gets rectified so I can put on a show for my hometown fans, man. That that would be that would be a dream come true to, especially for me to say I've done in my career to be able to say I've actually fought in New York City, New York, in front of my friends and family. You know, not a lot of people get to watch me live. They all get to watch on TV and stuff like that. But it's a different feel when you get to feel that energy and that love from the crowd. And I think that's one of the things I've been fortunate and blessed with, that a lot of people who have supported me, even being from other states and other hometowns, you know, typically when I go in my, I think my last two, three fights, I've gone out and I got huge receptions from the, from the crowd. And I think that's, it's awesome to see, man. It, you know, it makes me feel good that the, the work I'm doing is not going unnoticed and that the people are actually taking to, to my genuine personality, you know? And, yeah. It makes me it makes me feel good. This is what I do it for. You know, I, I fight for not only myself, but, you know, the fans, man. I, I like to entertain and I like to uh, put on a show. It's something we're seeing more and more recently. And, of course, there's no doubt that UFC is the biggest fight in promotion. However, we are seeing a lot, whether it be go to free agency or even switch into Bellator. Would you ever consider a move to a different promotion or are you content at staying with UFC? Uh, I don't plan on going, I don't plan on going anywhere. The only way I can see myself going somewhere if I were to lose, uh, my next fight or my next two fights, you know, so, um, I'm not really thinking about that. I'm thinking of how I could get back and climb the ladder so I can put myself in title contention once again. Yeah. Uh, that's the ultimate goal, man. You know, when you come up in the sport, everyone wants to be a ultimate fighting championship champion. That's that's the ultimate goal. Those three letters, UFC. Yeah. And I think um, it's the most recognizable name in this entire sport of MMA. 
And I think anybody would be lying to themselves if they were to say they didn't want to ever fight for the UFC world title. I think it's just the pinnacle of the sport, you know. Um, yeah. There's other tough divisions and other organizations, but let's call it what it is. You know, the UFC is definitely the cream of the crop. Um, I want to. I want to see if can I ever can I ever be number one. That's what I'm. That's what I'm doing this for. I want to see if can I truly ever be number one. Considered one of the best to go down in UFC bantamweight history and the history of the bantamweights in in general. Yeah, of course you yourself. You've already hit the mainstream. You're now an established name. One interesting, uh, one interesting thing is that your younger brother is also fighting and featuring on Dana White's looking for a fight. What can we expect from Troy in the future? What's what's for him in the future? Yeah, I'm not sure. He, he's uh he's got a pretty bad bunion. <laughs> he needs to he needs to either get surgery surgery to take care of that thing because that thing is starting to grow a head out the side. So right. Okay. Like he's growing an extra toe <laughs> out the side out of the side of his foot. And I know it hurts him a lot. It was killing him for the last training camp. And he's a he's a big music uh, musical artist. You know, he does hip hop. You know, he's actually done my workout songs since the beginning of my career. I want to say my amateur career. Yeah. And uh, I still work out to his songs and all that good stuff. And he fights on the, he fights on the side. He hasn't fought in like four years. That was his debut fight against a guy who was two and zero and undefeated as an amateur as well. So. To take a fight like that on, on short notice and get in there and and have that kind of a performance, I think that was a testament to how tough he is. And I, I would like to see my brother get back in there and just to get a win. And if this is not what he wants to do, that's fine. I just want to see him be able to, you know, say he he got a W and, and that was it, and uh, move on, move on with his life. If this isn't what he really wants to do, whether it be brothers or even sons in fighting, how much pressure do you think there is put on fighters with household names? And how do you think he'll react to that should he choose to fight? Uh, there might be some good amount of pressure. I know he, he, he doesn't like when people compare him to me. I, and I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but um, I know he doesn't like it too much. But you know, we're two completely different people. I guess uh, we, we always grew up kind of doing the same exact stuff, so I guess that's why people do that. Yeah. But hopefully uh, he he finds his own way, his own way. I always say I'm a true believer in doing what you truly love to do, and especially if you're gonna have to do it and it's not making any money, if you can still do it on the side, I think you should just go for it. I think that's what's gonna ultimately make people happy in life, doing something that they truly enjoy. So if if it's music, I want to see him do pursue music. If it's fighting, I want him to see pursue fighting. If it's a little bit of both, then Whichever one's the hobby, put that one aside. But I think MMA is just one of those sports you can't really do as a hobby because it's a uh, it's a it's the hurt business. You get you get hurt in this. And I think in that looking for a fight, man, he when he got hit with that head kick, bro, my heart stopped. I was like, oh my god, jumped out of my seat, and grabbed my head, like what the hell just happened? But he recovered and he recovered like a champ and kept fighting and rallied back. Rallied back. I thought he, I thought he might have edged it out. I thought he might have gotten a ten eight round in the third, but he rallied back and uh, he got the draw. So definitely can't be upset with that. Your brother fights at featherweight. We have also seen you compete at featherweight in the past. Is it a move you consider again, or are you looking to stay at bantamweight? Uh I don't know. I, I feel like I'm an in, I'm an in betweener. I'm like not a huge featherweight, but I'm I'm overly big bantamweight. And sometimes I feel like when I get down to this weight class, it kind of almost hinders my performance because I'm cutting so much, I'm losing muscle, that when I do get hydrated and everything, it's not the same as when I was competing during fight camp at 155. You know, I'm just a lot faster, um, a lot smoother, and of course a lot happier. But um, I don't know. We'll see. It depends if I could get any bigger. If I could get a little bigger and put on more mass when I get older – and I get tired of cutting weight, then that's where I'll be fighting. I think I have a, a good enough fight IQ. It's just a matter of how much uh, can I hang with those big boys, especially those those Russell-bound fighters who can take me down and, and try to just smother me and hold me down if I'm going to be strong enough to power back up. I think that's yeah. what it comes down to. The place to be fight this weekend, uh, you've been placed on the early prelims. Though it is a stacked card, do you feel sort of hard done by with being uh, being showcased so early? Ah, uh, not really. I mean, it was. I I understand. You know, they're giving these other guys a, a shot that they give me. They they have given me, um, for the last fight, 
and for the fight that I had against uh, Mizugaki. So they, they have given me a shot on Big Fox. It's just a matter of me being able to capitalize on it, and I think I came up short with the last one. I mean, I, be, I did take down Mizugaki, but it was kind of a very slow, not very exciting fight until, you know, I kind of grinded that one out because I, I didn't really trust in my striking abilities too much. I, I respected his boxing ability too too much. And that's what it is, man. It's just experience, getting more comfortable so I could do the stuff that I'm doing in the room in the octagon. And once that starts happening, man, it's going to be it's going to be scary. And I think I really, truly believe this is going to be the fight where people are going to see some crazy shit that I throw. <sighs> I'm highly doubtful that you're going to look past Mendes this weekend. But is there anyone you've got your eyes on in this division? Perhaps a rematch with Asen Kao? A rematch would be I would definitely be down for that. But I honestly I haven't even thought about anybody else besides a Sun uh, not a Sun Sao, um Mendez. I think I I feel like I'm fighting Mendez. I feel like I'm fighting a Sun Sao again, to be honest. I feel like they're almost exactly the same. They're just about the same exact height. I feel like they throw loopy hooks. Um I think a Sun Sao is a cleaner counter striker. Um Mendez likes to throw looping left hooks when he's walking backwards if you start pressing him he'll throw like this looping left hook left hook left hook and he'll keep his right hand by his chin and i got something for that and um i think he's just very good on the ground and i think that's the same thing with sun Sao. so i i think i'm fighting the same exact person he's just he's just not ranked i think he's a tough fighter i think he's uh definitely a force to be reckoned with i just think i'm just better i just really truly just think i'm better one final thing from me, Al Jermaine. Uh, do you believe you can become bantamweight champion? And if so, when? I definitely believe I can still be a bantamweight champion in the UFC. I think if, if it does happen, it will probably be – I'll probably be challenging for the title early 2018. Or who knows, man, maybe by the end of this year. It, it just really depends on how the the, uh, the division unfolds. If anybody gets hurt, there's always that possibility, man. I, yeah, Sun Sao fight is a split decision loss, man. I don't really put too much on that. I just need to make up for it and, and just get it back. If I could do that, I think I'm in a great position to put myself back in title contention and back in those those title talks. But I have to I have to look good winning and I have to do it impressively. Thank you very much for your time, and I wish you the best of luck this weekend. Thank you, appreciate it. Bye bye.